will now bring us the Bible readings for today. Thank you, Brian. Good morning. Uh, the readings this morning are from Proverbs. Um, the first being headed the gifts of wisdom. Does not wisdom call and does not understanding raise her voice on the heights beside the way at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries out. To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. Uh, the second part is entitled Wisdom's Part in Creation. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up, at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earths and fields, or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. When he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was, I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always. Rejoicing in his inhabited world and the delighting in the human race. And the last uh, reading is from John, chapter 16, verses 12 to 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thank you, Brian. On Trinity Sunday, one of the traditional biblical readings is from Proverbs which are a collection of collections of old sayings, including about wisdom. In, in Proverbs 8, which Brian just read to us, it opens with a reference to wisdom 
and understanding and later elaborates on the role of wisdom in God's purposes. And if we can just have that, oops, slide, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Oops. Uh, if you can. There we go. Thank you. So that's Proverbs eight, verse one. Does not wisdom call? And does not understanding raise her voice? No, call. Does not wisdom call? I've often wondered about the significance of this lectionary reading from Proverbs in relation to Trinity Sunday. It occurs every year on Trinity Sunday. And Trinity Sunday affords a special time to focus on the Christian doctrine, it's a doctrine of the Trinity, the unity of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Which doesn't seem to be here in that Proverbs reading. But Proverbs is an important reading and I'd like to focus this morning on wisdom's call and expand a little, if I can, on its connection to the Holy Trinity and hence Trinity Sunday. But what is wisdom? Wisdom is a word we use quite often, isn't it? It's a challenging word to explore, and many have grappled with it in the past and still today, now particularly with, with respect to the theological context. It's one of those attributes where perhaps one knows what it isn't rather than what it is. The concept of wisdom is highly significant in both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament. The Proverbs reading portrays the wisdom of God active in creation. And the Hebrew word used in Proverbs 8 is the feminine noun, chokmah. And you might remember last week, Graham was referring to the spirit or breath for the Holy Spirit and the Hebrew word ruach, which is also a feminine noun, both feminine. Which I gather in Hebrew, chokmah has a range of meaning, meanings covering both physical skill and intellectual wisdom. But in the Hebrew scriptures, it's mainly the latter. Wisdom is personified as female very appropriately, I would say, and I hope everyone would agree, with she being used in the text, as you heard today, and her. <coughs> and as Professor Alice McKenzie of Southern Methodist University in the United States has commented, uh, wisdom is depicted as a helpmate in creation in those later verses in Proverbs. And that at varying times in scripture and in church history has been identified with both the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we have all three there. In the New Testament, wisdom is translated from the Greek word, Sophia. And it denotes the capacity to not only understand something, but also to act accordingly. And it's this latter characteristic that separates wisdom from knowledge. Now we use, we use the word wisdom, the quality or state of being wise, to express skill, both human and divine. And it reflects a mix of knowledge, experience and judgment or discernment of what is true or right. Wisdom is the ability to make correct judgments and decisions and as, as such has been noted as an intangible quality gained through experiences of life and through knowledge. To make it perhaps just a little more tangible, there's a nice quote and I know I've mentioned this previously but I do like it. 
with regard to the humble tomato, which uh, this quote perhaps helpfully sums up part of it, what wisdom means. Knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. So that, yeah, I don't think you ever <laughs> put it in a fruit salad. So sometimes, though, uh, it may be unwise to make statements like another anonymous one I came across recently. I'm proud of myself. I finished a jigsaw puzzle in six months and the box said two to four years. <laughs> I quite like that one because I have trouble with crossword puzzles. So wis wisdom in <coughs> thus involves both a knowledge element and a decision or action element. However, we should also note the cautionary words of the great poet and writer Thomas Stearns Eliot, who won the, the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1948. He wrote in his pageant play, The Rock, where is the wisdom we lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we lost in information? Perhaps I can take this a little further uh, with this scene. <clears throat> I hope that's... You see that okay? Um, this is a photo of the Southern Alps in New Zealand from Gillespie's Beach in the South Island. In the mountains in the distance towards Fox Glacier. The mountains are, and, and the forest in the foreground are beautiful. And uh, this photo was taken by Susan and uh, we, we could obtain a lot of factual knowledge from this, from this area about the rocks and the ice, about the trees and the plants and birds. But the intrinsic beauty of that can't be converted to facts. And it is this beauty together with the nature <coughs> of the environment which was wisely recognised in the preservation of the area, firstly as Westland Taipatini National Park in 1960, and then more recently in 1990, it was part of the Southwest New Zealand Collective World Heritage Site, World Heritage Site designated by UNESCO for many to enjoy and be uplifted by. We can perhaps get further insights in, into the meaning of wisdom from looking at its use in other areas. And one example that comes to mind is um, the motto of my, my alma mater at the University of Western Australia in Perth. And this is the, the current crest of the university with the words, seek wisdom, seek wisdom. Its motto is, is simply yet profoundly these two words. These words come in fact from the Hebrew scriptures from Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 25. I turn my mind to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the sum of things. And that motto was the only one in English rather than Latin in an Australian university at the time of the university's founding over a hundred years ago. And in universities, the search for wisdom and truth are fundamental imperatives. And this motto reflects that and the ongoing nature of the process. Seek wisdom, it's ongoing, you don't stop. There's always further mystery and something more to be understood or discovered. Now, wisdom does involve both the physical and the non-physical realms, the realm of the, <coughs> of the physical itself um, and the realm of the spiritual. Wisdom involves skill and discretion and humility 
and being open to new understanding, to be prepared to listen and to respond to its call. We may respond to the call, but showing wisdom in Christian living today is often difficult. We often tend to make unwise judgments, I know I do. Judgments which are more self-centred than God-centred. Or when we are wise after the event, not before. But Jesus, the wisdom teacher, does show us the way does point to the key factors which should be taken into account in daily issues, both big and small. Perhaps not always directly, you might think, but certainly indirectly in loving our neighbours for the greater good of all. I wonder if I can reinforce this uh, with, another, with an example. And when Susan and I visited family in Perth in 2016, uh, we spent a pleasant day on the Perth Mandurah train. It's a very nice train. And Mandurah is a developing area on the coast uh, south of Perth, about 70 kilometres away. And uh, it's a very pleasant train, it carries a lot of passengers. They go to and fro between Mandurah and Perth at an average speed of 80 kilometres an hour, for those who'd like to know, but it can go up to 130 kilometres an hour. And uh, coming back to Perth, my attention was drawn to a very wisely expressed notice inside the carriage, headed, show your good side. Big notice on the inside of the carriage. It was put up by the rail authority, and uh, read as follows. Everyone on the train is different, with a different life, a different story, just like you. But now you're all there together sharing this ride. That means you need to think about each other for a moment. Nothing deep and meaningful, just a quick thought about whether or not you're sharing your music with someone who really doesn't want to hear it or if somebody needs your seat more than you. Or maybe you've drifted off and put your feet on the seat without thinking about the person who might be too scared to ask you to move them. That little thought can make a big difference to everyone on here, including you. We're all on this journey together. Let's make it an enjoyable one. Practical wisdom, I thought, which resonates very closely, actually, with Christ's teaching, thinking about others for the greater good. Jesus also encouraged his followers in Matthew chapter 6, as he encourages us today, to not be fixated on the material, on protection, but strive first for the kingdom of God. And all other things will follow. And we read from Matthew 6, verses 28 to 29 and verse 33. And I'll compress this a little bit. And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed or arrayed like one of these. And later, but strive or seek first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. The message of wisdom here seems quite clear that we should not worry about our protection or future so much. But I wonder if there's not a deeper subtext here. Perhaps there's even more to it than meets the eye or ear. The very wealthy, richly clothed King Solomon, 
who ruled for about 40 years as the son of King David, was also regarded as an extremely wise and astute Hebrew ruler. And hence the commonly used phrase, I think we've all heard it, the wisdom of Solomon. As in he or she will need the wisdom of Solomon to resolve such and such an issue or dilemma. This comes back to 1 Kings where it is written, God gave Solomon very great wisdom, discernment and breadth of understanding, as vast as the sand on the seashore. So Solomon was not only arrayed with fine clothes but also blessed with great wisdom. Yet even one lily, one flower, was arrayed, was arrayed in finer glory. The closer one looks at flowers and plants, actually, um, and nature in general, especially at the molecular level, which I'm very interested in, the more wonderful they become. In the case of the Matthew text, uh, scholars think Jesus was probably referring to a beautiful common plant in the region, the red anemone. And <clears throat> that's it there. The red, it's also called the crown anemone. And it's not, not a specifically a lily as such. It's in a different family. This flowering plant, which is native to the Mediterranean region of Europe, still means a lot in Israel and was chosen as the country's national flower in 2013. In 2020, when the world was very much in the grip of COVID, Susan and I received a nice note wishing us a happy and healthy Easter in April of that year from two of our Jewish friends in Israel, which included a picture of these flowers, quite a big picture, growing in a field. It was a very thoughtful and helpful action. Looking as a whole, however, at plants or flowers, one of the arraying attributes we often perceive is beauty, as in this anemone, as in flowers we have around us. Um, and uh, it's very good to see them, and thank you, Narelle, for supplying flowers in the church so regularly, and pot plants. We also have the flowers in a vase in the slide for the offertory prayer which will be coming up later. Someone's hand is putting a bunch of flowers through a, a curtain. And <clears throat> we also have you know, other flowers, if I can just... There's one from our backyard, Sigravillia. It was just starting to grow at that point. It's very much bigger now. It's just a beautiful flower. It's called bush lemons, if anyone is interested in it. It's a very nice Australian grevillea. And in perceiving beauty, I think we also have an uplifting feeling which can positively affect our mood and then what we might, as a result of that, in you know, what we might say or do to act with greater wisdom. And this also brings me back to the University of Western Australia, whose campus in Perth is a particularly beautiful one. And <coughs> that's a shot of it there, of the main building. Um, and there's a reflection pond in front of the building and the courtyard in front is called Whitfield Court. And in that area, there's a very nice memorial stone seat by the reflection pond. And it's inscribed in the stone with the words from a Robert Bridges poem. And it's the testament of beauty. And the words written there in stone are verily, by beauty it is that we come Verily, by beauty, it is that we come at wisdom. Verily, truly, or in truth. 
I often used to sit there in that area and, and think about those words. Now, I know I've focused uh, more to this point on our perceptions of wisdom or hum our perceptions or human wisdom rather than divine wisdom. Uh, the wisdom of God and Christ through the Holy Spirit. Traditionally, the two wisdom areas have been treated separately, but I feel that, that is a, it's valuable, very valuable, to humbly consider both in an intertwined fashion. We're all part of God's creation and God's call of wisdom is to us all, both individually and as a church. I do think, though, we do start to come at wisdom through beauty, the beauty of the way, the way of Christ, to help and encourage us to follow in the wisdom of Christ's way, we have the Holy Spirit. That was noted in the reading from John chapter 16 today. We have the Holy Spirit to help and encourage us through prayer, study, discussion, through being receptive, humble, teachable, and through helping others in need and looking for the good and beautiful in others and the world around us and always listening for the call of God's wisdom. To acknowledge wisdom, to heed her call is to love God and our neighbour and in so doing find her. We're always being called to seek the wisdom of God through Christ and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Amen. I wonder if we could just pray for a moment. Eternal and loving God, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the uplifting, renewing power of your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, in our understanding and actions as we seek to live in your way of wisdom and truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, noting the proclamation on the banner behind